It is time to move on. Turn to someone and say, it's time to move on. That's right. And so this morning I want to talk about a great destroyer of your destiny. And that is called complacency. Complacency is when you and I, you and or I, are so comfortable that we're unwilling to work to reach our next goal. There are many people that have gotten into this place where they are comfortable and they are complacent in the position that they hold. And the Holy Spirit wants to challenge you this morning. This is not a word that the pastor just kind of made up and said that's a good idea. This is from heaven to his children. God is speaking. And as I said last week with Brother Chris, that when we bring in a man of God or the man of God is in the house, the man of God is speaking. It's not about them, but it's about the message that they're bringing and it better be from heaven. You see, I stand up here with a holy awe. I stand up here with a holy fear. I am not interested in giving my opinion. I'm not interested in giving you my message. It's got to be the message from God to his people because we've got to move in the same direction to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. Jesus is coming. I said, Jesus is coming. I'm telling you, there's great preparation. And that's not fear. That is understanding that the church can no longer be complacent. We must be motivated like we've never been motivated before. We've been talking about excess baggage. And one of the challenges of excess baggage is that you and I will have all of the baggage and will never, ever, ever get on the flight. And today I want to read a verse from you for you. Numbers chapter 32, verses 1 through 5. It's a powerful verse. I've actually used it before, of course. And I've been preaching for 37 years, so I've used verses more than once. And this verse, to me, is one that is devastating. It is one that literally shows us what not to do. You know, there's one thing, doing something and learning the hard way. It's another thing, we can look at somebody else's failures and say, I don't want to be like that. I don't have to live it that way. When people come up to me and say, well, pastor, it's just the way it is. I always got to learn the hard way. That's really not an intelligent statement. You shouldn't be proud saying that. That is a very bad statement. If you've always got to learn the hard way, you're saying I'm not an intelligent human. The word wisdom means to learn from your mistakes and other people's mistakes. It is much wiser to learn from somebody else's mistakes than your mistakes. Why? Because you don't have to feel the pain they already felt for you. Say amen. So it's time to say, I want to be wise and learn from these people. Here we are in uh, Numbers chapter 32, 1 through 5. The Reubenites and Gadites, who, are, who had very large uh, herds and flocks, saw the lands of Jezir and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar, the priests and the leaders of the community, and said, Athron, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Hezbon, Elia, Sabam, Nebo, Beon. Dear Lord, why would you do that to your children? <laughs> the land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel are suitable for livestock. And your servants have livestock. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not take us to over the river Jordan. Now, the problem with this is I want to share the story. And the story is, if you remember, the children of Israel were in bondage for 400 years. They were servants and they were slaves to the Egyptians. And they called out to the Lord, and the Lord sent them a deliverer. His name was Moses. And God, by his spirit, God with the supernatural, released the children of Israel, about two and a half million people, to go with Moses to the promised land. It was about a 14-day walking trip. How many of you know that's pretty far? But really, it's not for two and a half million folk. So off they go, and they come to the very first obstacle, and the first obstacle is the Red Sea. You know what's amazing is you can get people out of Egypt, but it doesn't mean that Egypt is out of the people. And so what's happened here, they're now at the river, the, the Red Sea, and they start turning on Moses. 
saying, man, we'd rather eat cabbage. We're going to kill you for what you did because the Egyptians were coming to come after them and bring them back into bondage. But God, by his supernatural power, rolled back the Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. They were thirsty and they came to a well. And when they came to the well, it was bitter. So again, they started to turn on the man of God. They started to say it would be better for us to have been back in Egypt. I want you to know something, that those who are unwilling to move forward will always love the back more than the front. They will always love to return to where they came from. They will always love their past sin. They will always love their past life, even though what they prayed for is in process. When it becomes difficult, they'd rather go back to Egypt. I can't tell you how many people it baffles me have been delivered from alcohol, have been delivered from drugs, who God has set free and free indeed, end up going back to the world. Why would you go back? You left there in the first place because you knew it was bondage. You left there in the first place because you knew it was not the place of prosperity or the promised land. Why would you go back to what you were delivered from? But people do it all the time. Turn to someone and say, that's not me. Tell them I refuse to go back. And you see, this is the challenge that God has with his people. He's saying, learn from the children of Israel. Here they now, they, they came and they're at the, at the promised land and they sent in the 12 spies. Two came back with the report of the Lord and 10 came back with the report of humanity by what they saw, not what they saw. The challenge is this, is that many people would rather believe the collective rather than believe the word. You see, God's promise was yea and amen. And it really didn't matter what the 10 said. What matters is what God says. Can I hear an amen from you? And so as a believer, we've got to recognize that not everybody's going to agree with you, but you are called to agree with the word. Amen. Say amen. amen. So as believers, all of a sudden now, they did not enter the promised land. And for 40 years, you know what's really cool about that is even when you're not right with the Lord, I'm not, I'm not talking you're living in sin, but you're not right with God. You're not in God's best. You've refused to step into the promised land. God is still going to bless you. For 40 years, they walked around the desert. The Bible says that God provided food for them every single morning. Can you imagine not having to go to Wegmans? But all of a sudden, you walk out the door of your tent, and there is food for you and your family for the whole day. Say amen. That's what God did. But what was even better than that was the Bible says that their clothes never wore out, which means their clothes grew on their bodies. So when they went from a size five to a size 10, literally it grew on their body. Their clothes did not disintegrate over time, but grew with them. That's the supernatural God that we serve. Amen. So the Bible says that that whole generation needed to pass away because of their unbelief. And now finally, they're back at the spot. They're back at the place. And Moses is getting ready. He's saying, there's the promised land. That's what God's promise is. That's God's destination. That's what he's been declaring since Abraham. And I want you to know that that's where we're going. But something happened that should shatter us and bring us to an awakening in our life. And that is that Reuben and Gad, the two tribes, said this. We've got livestock. And even though the promised land is across the river Jordan, we like it here better. So many believers are so complacent, they like the world they're living in better than the promised land. They would rather live in their sin. They would rather live in their struggle. They would rather live in their comfort. They would rather live in their complacency than step across to God's blessing. And it's time as a believer to reject the good, but lay hold of the great. You said, yes, there was grass. Yes, they had livestock. Yes, it made sense not to cross over. But I'm here to tell you, they literally surrendered God's best just to be satisfied with what their eyes could perceive. You and I cannot be that way in the spirit, especially in these last days. God needs his body to be acute in understanding, acute in growth. And we must make a determination that I am going forward and not backwards. Say amen. amen. 
So what happens is all of a sudden you've booked a flight and you've got this flight all set up, man. You're going to a destination you've always wanted to go to. You've watched the videos. You've watched your YouTubes. You've watched and, and, and talked to people that have been there and you are so excited about that. And, and so you booked your ticket. Your plane is, 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 is scheduled to leave at a specific time and you have got to wake up in the morning. So all of a sudden you go to sleep on all your baggage. You see, some of you love your baggage so much, you even sleep with it. And God is saying, it's time for you and I to recognize that this is not comfortable. For decades, you have been sleeping on your past wounds. You've been sleeping on your past problems. You've been sleeping on your past disqualifications. And God is saying it is time to get out of your past and move into your future to be a person that is going to truly excel. And that means you've got to get on your next plane for your destination. news please it's news It's my flight. I know. That's what I said. I'm going to miss my flight. You rush off and you get to the airport and you what? Missed your flight. Why? You couldn't get out of bed. The problem is our comfort many times is more important than our destination. We like being so comfortable, so complacent. That even though you booked the destination, even though the plan is to go, even though you bought your ticket, you gave your heart to Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to reach your promised land. And it has nothing to do with God. It has to do with whether or not you're going to get up or not. Whether you're going to stay complacent. Whether you're going to stay just in your comfort zone. I want you to recognize if you're never out of your comfort zone, then you're living in the land of the complacent. And living in the land of the complacent means you're never going to move forward. We've got to make a determination that, listen, now we've got a lot of mess in our life. Say amen. amen. Boy, that, that, that's got a little bit more mess. That's my actual suitcase. I got to pop it back out. <sighs> what? Case. Yeah, don't tease me. I'm a sensitive human. <laughs> Here's what the
what the Bible says about complacency. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 32. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. Isn't that an amazing verse? To recognize that even though you had, come on now, you had your swimsuit in your suitcase. You had your beach towel all set up. You had everything in order. But man, you could not get out of bed. You loved comfort so much that you refused to get on the airplane. You refused to get up out of those warm, comfortable Come on now, especially this morning. Can I hear an amen this morning? I'm talking getting up this morning. Our heat's on 64 degrees. Getting up this morning and getting into the shower. You jump into that shower. I want you to know that you jump in that shower kind of quick. But when you get out, it's, woo, it's cold. And you brush your teeth. You do your hair. You get it all done all quickly. Why? Because I need to get some clothes on because it's chilly in here. I, it's so much easier to remain in bed. Too many Christians love sleep too much. Trying to teach the Bible school students that. Don't love sleep. Because if you're going to be in ministry, you're going to do God's will. You're going to reach your destination. It's not a sleeping moment. You're going to have to be a person that is going to repel complacency. That is going to welcome discomfort. You're going to welcome the positions to where you're going to have to trust God. You're going to have to believe that God is able to do abundantly above all you can even ask or imagine. But you don't have to believe God if you're always in control of your life. If you're living in a land of the comfort, you don't need God. Or so your brain presupposes. You see, the devil doesn't need to send a horde of demons to keep you from your destination. Most people do it for him. We just sit back and we never grow up in Christ. There are people that, that have been born again 10 years that we strive. We got to come after you to come to church. There's a problem there. You're living a complacent Christian lifestyle. There are people that have been born again 10 years. You should be teaching other people, but you still need milk. There are people, the man, you, God needs your life. He needs your ministry. He needs you to touch other people. But yet you still sit back and you whine and you cry. Why? Because you've never grown up. You become so comfortable in your whining Christian mentality that you've stopped stepping forward and growing up in Jesus. It's time to build faith. Can I hear it? Amen. It's time to walk in faith. Can I hear it? Amen. It's time to grow up in Christ. Can I hear it? Amen. But you can't grow up in Christ if you land in the, live in the land of the comfort let's talk about our flight okay here we are we spent the time online we booked our flight we spent the time we got our luggage together we set our alarm we then got to wake up to our alarm prayerfully you take a shower before you get on an airplane we all believe God that everyone's going to do that. Say amen. amen. You then got to drive to the airport. You then got to go into the desk. You then got to check in your luggage. You then got to walk through TSA. You then got to put your shoes on again. Jesus, help us all. You then got to go and wait. Then they board you. Then you get in a seat that you pray is a little bit more comfortable than the seats in the back. Say amen. And then you fly, and then you get off your flight, and then you gotta walk to baggage claim. You gotta pick up your baggage again, and then you gotta walk out to the car that's waiting for you, or go get in a bus to go to the rental car place, and then you gotta rent your car, then you gotta drive to your destination. Where in any part of that do you see complacency or comfort? But are you happy when you get to the hotel? See, this is the problem is that when we get to the place that we think that there is no work to acquire God's best for your life, there is a delusion that has taken a hold of you. And we've got to know this, that God has a phenomenal plan for your life. He's got greatness for you, not goodness. God has an outpouring of his spirit in your life for you. And God wants to bless you abundantly above all you could even ask or imagine. But God can't do that until you at least get on the plane. You can book your ticket all you want, but until you get on the plane, you're not going to the destination. 
And when you get on the plane, you can't take all of your baggage unless you want to pay a lot. As believers, we've got to make decisions in our lives, and that is how good is our comfort zone? How much do we love where we're at? How important is it that we live without being bothered by anybody or have any struggle in life? You know what the saddest part is? Is that most people will never move out of complacency until there's pain. It is the saddest thing that we've got to wait till pain to come to where we'll finally start getting out of our comfort zone and growing up in Christ. I want you to know that God will not, will not bring evil in your life. I'm sorry, already missed my plane. God will not bring evil in your life, but God does allow evil to come into your life. I don't like that answer. Well, who does? But sadly, sometimes that's the only time you're going to move. The only time you're going to be motivated. Sadly, if that is what motivates you, then you always sit back in comfort until pain comes. And most people turn around and blame God for the pain. But if you make a determination, I don't need pain to grow up in Christ. I don't need pain to get out of complacency. I don't need pain to get out of my comfort zone. I don't need pain to grow in my faith. Then guess what? When the trials come, after you've done all you can do to stand, stand there for, and the power of his might, you will not be moved to the right or the left, but your eyes will be fixed on Jesus, the author and the finish of your faith. You'll stand strong. You'll stand powerful. You'll show a testimony that God is good all the time and never bad. But you see, when you live that comfortable, complacent lifestyle, you wait for the pain, and when it arrives, you're not prepared for the pain, so therefore all you can do is complain. That is not God's plan for his church. This baggage called complacency needs to be kicked out of our lives. Until you're willing to kick complacency out, then you're going to constantly never make your next flight. That's why people get bored in the kingdom. If you're bored with your walk with God, that's not God, that's you. God's not boring. God's plans aren't boring. God's kingdom isn't boring. God's challenges aren't boring. So when you're bored in your walk with God, immediately you know you are living in the land of the complacent. And there's got to be a change in your heart. Say amen. Turn to someone and say, you've got to change your heart. What's really neat about this story is here they are generations after Abraham. Remember, God spoke to Abraham and he said, I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you, you like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. I'm going to bring you to a land of promise. I'm going to bring you to your land that I have for you. So all of this is like amazing promises. How many of you wouldn't mind those promises? Those are amazing promises. But unless Abraham left Haran, it would never happen. You've got, to be living, you've got to be willing to leave your comfort zone. So even though the promises, this promise right here is Genesis 12, 7, Genesis 26, 2, and 3, Genesis 28, 12, and 13, Genesis 35, 11, and 12, Genesis 48, 3, and 4, Genesis 50, verse 24. All of these verses show the same exact promise, confirmation after confirmation after confirmation, that God desires to bless them with the land that he wants to give them and that it will be a prosperous land, a land filled with milk and honey, that they would have fruit and they would have everything they would need and they would be designated as God's people. This was the promise way back with Abraham. And now we see this, the, these two clans. Listen, we know that's the inheritance we know that's God's best. We know that's God's promise, but we like it better over here. How many believers over the decades that I've been serving Jesus have I seen sacrifice God's best to settle for foolishness that lasts such a short period of time? 
satisfaction. I ain't got no satisfaction. But I try and I try. And you're going to keep trying. Why? Because the only true satisfaction is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you start walking in his will, you start doing God's promises, you will find that they are yea and amen. You will find that the promised land is real. And that promised land for you might not be Israel, but that promised land for you is the promises that God has spoken to you through his word, that you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord, that there's not one weapon that's formed against me shall prosper, that I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out. I am blessed in my storehouse. I am blessed in my basket. I am the head and not the tail. You see, when you know who you are, your identity, and you say, God knows I refuse to land, land in the, li live in the land of the grass. I want to live in the land of the living where God's promises are yea and amen. You know, what's really interesting is they, 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 they told Moses this. And you know what Moses said to them? Guess what? You still got to go. You're still going to have to go and fight. You're still going to have to fight for the inheritance of your brothers and sisters. So you can have that second best, but you're still going to have to fight for the best. Is that insanity or what? So here they go into the promised land and they're fighting. They're fighting and taking the promised land. They're taking the inheritance. And then they walk back over the river Jordan and go back to the grass rather than the promise. How many of us have relinquished? We have fought a good fight for a period of time, but instead of finishing the race, we went back to eating grass. Man, we got to stop that. Say amen. amen. Turn to someone and say, don't do that. Amen. Don't do that. Come on now. We've got to move forward. This is God's promise. This is God's inheritance. Here they are. Don't take us over the river Jordan. The river Jordan across it was the promise. They were on the threshold of God's best. They were on the threshold of the destination that their forefathers walked in the, come on now, they walked in circles for 40 years about. But they were willing to surrender their inheritance for their comfort. For what their eyes saw, second best. Some of us got to make decisions in our lives. Second best is just not good enough for me. I'm sorry. I've paid personally too high of a cost in my life. I paid way too much. I've seen way too much. I've seen miracle after miracle. I know my God. I have gone through tragedy and trial. I've gone through great loss of death. I have gone through people's ac accusations and, and belittling. I've gone through people trying to destroy. I've gone through too much to say I'm okay with the grass. I've got to have the promise. I've got to have the promise. Are you so determined in your heart? It does not matter. It does not matter what the grass is. It don't matter if it looks good with your eyes. It matters what God has promised you. You see, Across that Jordan was Jericho. Jericho, the walls were so high you couldn't climb them. The walls were so wide you could run two chariots across them at the same time. And the Bible says that the people of Jericho looked down and they mocked the children of Israel. They mocked them. Why? Because they knew there was an impenetrable fortress. But yet, I want you to know that they made a determination. They were not going to stay Come on now. They were not going to stay in the grass, but they were going across to the promised land. God's best. And God gave the plan. And God said, walk this way. And when God said, walk this way, on the seventh day, they made the blast of declaration of the power of God. And the walls didn't fall out. They didn't fall in. They fall straight down. A miracle occurred. You will never have a Jericho moment if you stay in the grass. You will never live in victory because you will always just be a person that's satisfied with what you got. Well, the Bible says, 
be satisfied with all things. Take it in context. It's not talking about what God's promises are. It's talking about when you're going through a trouble that you set and you rely on God to get you through it. I'm here to tell you now, it's, it's, it's not possible for me to sit back and just pacify and placate myself and live in a land of complacency. I'm a pusher. I'm a driver. Why? Because I see the promised land in front of me. I see God's purpose in front of me. You're sitting in God's purpose. You're sitting in God's plan. 20 years ago, this building was not here. It was just a field filled with corn, but today it's filled with souls. It's filled with people. Why? Because I said, I'm not satisfied with having a church of 50 folk. I'm not satisfied with sitting over in the corner. I know what God is spoken to me. I know what God is doing in me. I know what the vision is. And no matter what the cost and baby, it costs. Comfort is not your friend. Oh, it costs a lot for nice egg. This for darn sure. Here we go. Our problem is that we've got so much baggage. It takes more work than it's supposed to to get you to your destination. And God is saying, listen now, I didn't call you to carry all that. I didn't call you to take that to the airport. I didn't call you to sleep on it. I called you to get it out of your life. You've got to make a determination that you're unwilling to keep all of your luggage. Your past life. Do you know that some people, they actually will not get out of their past wounds because they become friends with their wound. Their wound is their comfort. And because their wound is their comfort, they carry that suitcase the rest of their life. And guess what? That has lithium batteries in it. It's not allowed on the airplane. You can't even board. How much are you willing to sacrifice of God's best to live a complacent, comfortable lifestyle? For some of you, it's worth it all. That's what your heart is. God is confronting you this morning. See, I know, how to, I know how to grow a church. Let me tell you how. 59 minute service, 20 minutes of nice worship, nothing too aggressive, five minutes of announcements. Everybody says hi to each other, and the preacher preaches 25 minutes maximum. And it's always nice cooing stuff. Love, 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 the kingdom is suffered by violence and the violent take it by force. As a believer, we've got to recognize that comfort is not my friend and that in my short years on this planet, and let's be real, how short they are. I remember the days when I would look at people in their 40s and say, oh my goodness, they're so old. Now I'm getting ready in a few weeks to beckon 58 years of age. I'm almost 60. Not that that's old. I'm almost 60 years old. I remember looking at my dad and saying, he's 60. He's an old man. Now stop. <laughs> it's true. The problem is we love this life too much. God created it to enjoy. God created it to be blessed. God created it to be victorious. But this is not your home. This is not your home. 
So when you slide into the world of complacency, when you slide into the world of comfort, and you are stop willing to pay the price to grow up in Christ, then you're abandoning the longer term for the short term. And let's be real, if a thousand days is uh, as a year, uh, if a thousand days is at a year, if a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, how long is your life? It's not even a day in eternal mind. Yet we love it so much that we're willing to live in sin, live in comfort, live in complacency, and then want God's blessing. That is delusional. We've got to make a decision in, the, in our hearts. And I'm, I'm telling you, that's one of the reasons that we're not 5,000 folks in the Northeast. Why? Well, because I'm not willing to preach just everybody pacified and placated. I'm willing to push you. I want to push you. I know God wants to push his children. I know God wants to grow up his family. I know God wants to take this region. I know God wants to touch New York. I know God wants to span the globe. I know God wants people saved that you never even thought were possible to be born again. God is calling them. God is calling them. But God can't do it because he's chosen to use us. And when we live comfortable and complacent, we won't even share the gospel because they might tell us no. Come on now. It's time to be reformed. Don't matter the form you are. It matters the form he wants you to be. And when you are, there's the anointing. When you are reformed in Christ, then you become that vessel of honor. And when we cross, come on now. Cross into eternity. We can look at him as John 17, 4 says, Father, whoop, Father, I have pleased you because I have finished the work on earth you sent me to do. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. I don't know about you. There are a lot of words that can be said. My wife tells me I'm the most amazing man on the planet and that I am perfect. I am like Superman and I am as sexy as the man could be and that I am the most brilliant human on the planet. And she really doesn't say that stuff. <laughs> you can get all the accolades you want. But if you get to heaven, you don't get one. Baby, something's missing. In this year of reformation, you've got to ask yourself a question. When was the last time I was in discomfort? Maybe getting up in the morning to pray. Maybe being faithful to church. <laughs> I never thought I'd have to say that. But the average Christian now goes to church only one every three weeks in America. In the countries where persecution is normal and discomfort is part of living because if you're caught, you're imprisoned or killed because you call yourself a Christian. When there's opportunity, they're always there. Persecution has always been, watch now, pain has always been the greatest motivator. Why wait for the pain to be motivated? Be like Christ. Not Mike. Be like Christ. It's time to grow up. Say amen. amen. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to grow up. <laughs> Come on now, be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Second Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. Today, if you died this moment, which really isn't unrealistic. We don't like to talk about that stuff. It makes everybody uncomfortable. But the fact is, is you're not promised tonight. 
I promise tonight. I remember Brittany and her sister were on their way home from church. I don't remember what, what you were here for, but it was an event. And they got in a car accident on the way home. Praise the Lord, they were both okay. But they never said, hey, you know, we want to make sure we're right with God because on the way home, we might get in an accident. Thank God they lived out of the land of complacency. My question to you is this. If you died today, would you even go to heaven? Well, I'm a nice person. Nice people don't get to heaven. Well, I'm sincere. Sincere people don't go to heaven. Well, I go to church. Church people don't go to heaven. There's only one name under heaven who shall you shall be saved. It's the name of Jesus. The Bible says that only Jesus can wash your sins away. Only Jesus can change your heart. Take the heart of stone out, put a heart of flesh. Only Christ can forgive you of your sin. That's it. Well, pastor, I gave my heart to the Lord 10 years ago. But you haven't grown an ounce. So the real question is, do you actually love God or you're just using God? Yeah. Come on, you've all had people that have used you. You know, the only time they call you is when they want something. You know when the phone rings, you know what they're calling for. Hey. You just know it. Is that your phone call to heaven? Only when you need something? Or do you have a living, vibrant relationship with the living God? It's time to kick comfort to the side and start running after Christ. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you lifestyle. It's going to cost you some of your friends. It's going to cost you experience. It's going to cost you. But baby, you will never get a greater return for your cost than what Christ can give. Run after Jesus with all you got. Amen. Bow your heads with me this morning. Today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, listen, I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to join religion. I'm only asking you to know, know Jesus. I want you to ask him into your life. Stop playing games. Some of you are so backslidden. Man, God's got pain coming. Not because he wants to bring it, but he'll allow it to save you. Don't be so foolish to think he doesn't love you enough. Today, if you're not right with God, you want to get right with heaven. You want to, you want to know. I want you to slide your hand up right now. Just put your hand right in the air, right where you are. You want to get right with God. I'm not going to wait long. Listen, who cares who's beside you? Thank you in the back. Thank you very much. Put your hand right back down. Is there anyone else? I said, don't matter who's beside you, your mommy or your daddy, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband or wife, nobody's standing with you before God. You're going to give judgment just for yourself. Learn that one quick. You're responsible for you. Is there anyone else that wants to get right with God this morning? Put your hand right up in the air. Five, come on. He's waiting for you. Four. Come on. Heaven is calling you. Three. You can feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Get your hand up. Get your hand up. Two. Last call. And one. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Is that all right that I'm confrontational? You know what the best part is? Is I got to be confronted before you are. That's the worst part about being the preacher. He slams you before he, he speaks to his family. You got to make sure you're preaching because you're living it. Amen. Nothing worse than a preacher who preaches something he don't live. It's called hypocrisy. I'm not perfect. Say amen. That's your moment. I didn't ask you to say amen. I asked her to say amen. <laughs> we
would you get a choir together or what? <laughs> I'm going to have the prayer team come to the front of the altar. Some of you need to get rid of complacency. You need to ask God to forgive you. It means you've got to ask God to forgive you. You can do that right in your seat. In fact, can we pray that together? Pray this right out loud with me. Jesus, uh, everybody, Jesus, I thank you that you love me. Thank you that I got saved. Thank you that you changed my heart. Thank you that I know I'm going to heaven. But you don't have me there yet. So right now, I ask that my destination starts getting clearer. Your plan for my life starts to unfold. Your purpose is clear. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for complacency, for comfort, for being lazy. I'm going to run to you. I'm going to run for you. And I'm going to help as many people as possible know you as their Savior. I will fill my road next week. I will ask many people, even in my discomfort, to come to church with me next week so that I will be a person that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raise your hand for salvation, the gentleman in the back, right over on this side, is T and Mo. We'd love to pray with you. Please don't escape. If you're watching online right now, there's a phone number that's available for you right now. It is 833-459-5785 or go to our website, hisTabernacle.com. Fill out the information. Send us a, a message. We would love to be able to be there no matter where you are in the world today. We want you to know that God loves you. He's got a great plan for you. He's got great purpose for you and that God will bless you. Have a great day in Jesus' name. I love you all. Serve God with all of your heart. Fill your role. I'll see you Thursday night for communion nights.